Hey everybody and welcome to episode 20 of Rapid Fire and today myself and Carl have got a guest that does not need much introduction at all. Ladies and gentlemen we have got Winters from well Winters SEO and Deployment Zone TV. How are you doing? I'm very good thank you. Hi how are you? Hi. I'm very well thank you. <laughs> it's, Your yeah. hair looks lovely. Don't have to oh. do that. It's lovely hair. It's easier if you wear a hat. <laughs> I try well, not. I try not it. to. <laughs> yeah, might go on my face. Easy. Yeah. That's the way to do it. If you can compensate, then it, it works out fine, doesn't it? Um, so much like yourself and some of the people out there may not have seen um, any episodes of this before. The first thing we're going to do is going to put you right through the ringer, get you in the rapid fire challenge. Uh, the nice. quickest time to answer 15 questions so far. Okay. The quickest is 53 seconds. Okay. Um, so let me try and uh, remember where a couple of your boys came. Right. Quipster okay. was at yes. 1 minute 13. Right. And Sultan was 1 minute 27. Okay. So do the answers to the questions have to make sense? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that would help, but it depends okay. on, it would depend on things. But they are yeah. relatively easy questions. Um, Having said right. that, at the then, bottom of the leaderboard currently is me, and I've taken about three and a half minutes. So as long as you don't have a cup of tea or go to sleep or leave the room okay. while you're answering, you won't come last. <laughs> right. So if you're ready, we'll crack on with the rapid fire challenge. Then right, we've do done this. that. We'll give you your time, and then we're just going to come through and talk all about you and your projects and your life and everything like that. If you're happy. Yes. Kushti. So right. your time starts now how many years have you been in the hobby uh since it started what game systems do you follow uh lots let's just say 40k for now because it's a time limited thing what are your current armies uh i've got nine of them next <laughs> what was your first ever miniature <laughs> uh space marines the very first space marine ever what was your first full army one minute no, it wasn't Space Marines. If we're not talking about 40K, we're talking back to lead stuff back in the day. Um, it wasn't a Space Marine. It was like dwarves and things because I was in the hobby before 40K existed. Next question. First army, skeletons, fantasy. What model or unit have you enjoyed painting the most? Um, well, the most over that period of time? Don't know. Next. Least. What model or unit have you enjoyed painting the least? Uh, land speeders. What was the last model you completed? Uh, Vanguard Veterans of Mark III Power Armor. How much hobby time do you get per week? Um, how many hours are there in a week? That's how much hobby time. <laughs> <laughs> what is the current model you're working on? Mark III Vanguard Vets. What is your single favorite thing about the hobby? People. What is your least favorite thing about the hobby? People. Who or what <laughs> got you into the hobby? Um, a shop with toys in it. What keeps you in the hobby? Um, people. What is your one hobby target for the remainder of this year? One hobby target? I've got thousands of hobby targets. Um, one hobby target for the remainder of the year? I can't answer that because I don't have one. <laughs> you know what? <laughs> I'll allow it. I'll allow it. But that's, that's it. Uh, you did it in one minute and 42 seconds. I know, but... Because it, it puts you around six or seven. It's mark. normally 40k, it's loaded bolter, it's 40k stuff, but then you start talking about the hobby. Yes. And that's a very that's a very existential question, isn't it? Philos philosophical question. What is the hobby? Does it end at 40k? Does it stretch into Warhammer Fantasy? Does it include D and D? Does yes. it include sitting down and watching Lord of the Rings? Because that is one movie, not three <laughs> movies. Is that part of a hobby? I don't know. I what mean is the hobby. If it's small and you put it together and paint it, I think that's the hobby. Or you can play it or read it in terms of like the law around that small plastic miniature. I think that counts as the hobby. So technically Lord of the Rings would count because that's law for the Middle Earth strategy game. Does you can Lego also... count? Does Lego count as the hobby? <laughs> I would love it to actually. <laughs> Say we were like can using piss out of your friends Lego. And we were going pew pew with the Lego stuff. And we had I mean, rules. Some people have made Lego dreadnoughts, so they do exist. Good. Very true. Yeah. yeah. 
Um, so what, tell, tell us about the first time you spotted a small miniature and thought to yourself, I want to do that. I want to paint that. I want to play that. I want to know more about that. The first time would have been 1984. And it was in a large toy store and walking around the toy. Toys R Us didn't exist back then, I don't think. They don't exist now. But it was a large toy store walking around. And in the back, in the corner, there was model aeroplanes and things like that and modeling materials. And then in amongst the modeling materials and the model planes and things like that, there were some blister packs and there must have been about 20 or so blister packs. And they were Citadel miniatures and like dwarves and skeletons and things. So um, I bought some and some paints and then, yeah, that's, that was the first time. Yeah, I didn't know what I was doing. I was about, how old was I in 94? About 11. Yeah. I mean, that, that sounds familiar. I think every time we all clapped eyes on miniatures, we bought something and had no idea what on earth we were doing. We just liked the look of it. Um, yeah. So, I mean, that's, that, that's pretty cool. And now, obviously, you've graduated after some years. We'll call it some years. We'll not expose <laughs> the amount Very that's been there. I know, right? But, um, and now you're at a point where, obviously, you've got the channel or the channels, because obviously you've got your own, you've also obviously got the Deployment Zone TV, it's all interlinked. Um, you know, how, how has that journey been? How's that journey been? Uh, um, the, the deploy, um, mm, yes. <laughs> I met my girlfriend, now wife, uh, a number of years ago now, about eight years ago. And I was watching battle reports online and there wasn't very many battle reports online back then. There was mini wargaming, there was Striking Scorpion, there were quite a lot of other smaller people, but a lot of the battle reports were only about 10 minutes long because of the memory time on phones and people were filming them on their phones at clubs. And a lot of them were also summary battle reports, people talking through what happened rather than showing the whole dice rolling thing. And she said, what, what are you watching them for? All And I said, I, I watched this and this is what I do. And this is fun. And blah, blah, blah. you know, I told her about Toy Soldiers on our first date. So we got that out of the way really quickly. Um, <laughs> Hurdle number and one. Then, uh, I was watching a lot of these things and she said, well, why don't you film one yourself? And I said, I don't know how to. So she, she showed me how to. And then she edit, edited it and then she put it together and up on the internet. And she launched the Winter's SEO YouTube channel because that was the handle I was using on the Xbox at the time. Uh, all the SEO guys, Swindon and Elite Ops, we're, we're all a bunch of us on the Xbox and blah, blah, blah. Playing with my friends, boom, put it on there. And then for some reason, it just kept growing and growing and growing and growing. And now here we are. Um, Deployment Zone came about because there was a couple of failed attempts to try and uh, monetize the hobby a bit more for me so it could pay for itself because it was getting jolly expensive like when i started on youtube had one army <laughs> had space marines but then you want more and more and more and you want to show more and terrain and stuff and things and uh, advertising revenue on youtube isn't great so i tried to uh, various ways of monetizing the hobby and asking for support and then Deployment Zone came about as a way of, well, other people have done it as well. So Striking Scorpion, The Vault, uh, Tabletop Tactics, other people have these subscriptions-based services where supporters can support them. <laughs> so we did it, the same thing. And that grew and eventually provided me with enough income to leave the factory, which is lovely because I was working at a factory in Swindon for 20 years. So that was a long ass shift that was that was that was time <laughs> yeah you put your so time in days you definitely yeah uh, you, you definitely uh you've definitely done your time at the factory and obviously it's good mm. that you're now in the position where you're able to live the dreams that i'm sure we would all like to you get to play with toy soldiers all day and paint them and film them and talk yeah. to people about toy soldiers and be all about the toy soldier life like that's 
that's got to feel awesome after all those years of working for the man, as they say. Yeah, it's uh, yeah, it's it's yeah. One of the things that happened actually once I uh, managed to get out of the factory after COVID started unlocking is because b- beforehand it was working. Um, I would work three on, three off, rotating shifts, so three sets of three days, then three sets of three nights, and three sets of three days, and three sets of three nights, twelve hour shifts, and. Um, in between those, the, on the three off, that would give me a couple of days of 40K filming, editing, painting, whatever I needed to do in one day with, one day with uh, my wife, essentially. And that's what it was for many, many, many years. One of the things that happened during that time is I didn't have a, an opportunity to see very many of my friends. And one part of the hobby I didn't know how much I missed has started coming back to me since we were able to do Garden Hammer and the lockdown beginning to unlock again. I've started uh, getting, and it also happened when we had that period, we had a period around October, November last year where we could sort of semi meet again for a bit. Um, I've been able to meet up with my, so when you talk about sitting around talking 40K with your friends, I've been able to do that more and um, I wasn't doing it at all really i was talking to the wider community everyone in the community and people coming so that part of actually sitting down playing with your friends talking with your friends um talking about lists uh painting it's a very crucial part of the hobby i think and i really missed it and i didn't know how much i missed it until i got it back because i didn't think i missed it because i thought i was doing that anyway with everyone but it turns out um Doing it in your your closest social group is uh, it's yeah. So I've got that back now. That's that's news that occurred to me like a month ago. It's like wow, this is fun. This bit is fun. I didn't know that I'd lost that fun bit. Do you know what I mean? hundred percent. I mean myself and and Carl, we've obviously got like a WhatsApp group. Of it. We meet all the time. It's our little play group. It's most of the guys from the Loaded Bolter, um, and obviously we've got like a WhatsApp chat going and there's always some kind of conversation happening in there. Even if it's not armies that you're interested in, they're they're bouncing ideas off people. I'm I'm, I'm thinking about doing this. I want to do that. Lists are being thrown in there, you know. Oh, I'm playing so-and-so. So So you're getting updates from that game. Like, it is just, it's just awesome that at any point you can just sit there and read 200 messages of (laughs) Warhammer-related material. Yeah. I think talking about Warhammer is almost a hobby in itself. You know, you can... Uh, one of the guys in the group, James, um, came around for a game sort of before lockdown and we played the game and we finished at about, I'd say, 10 o'clock at night. Um, and he left at about half 12 because nice. we spent two and a half hours, him gradually getting closer to the front door while we were talking about things. And then he'd remember something else and sit down again. And we'd be like, oh, yeah. And then we'd talk about Catan or how Necrons work or, you know, what kind of um, beer orcs drink. And before you know it, it's nearly one in the morning and you've got to go to work the next day. So. It's yeah. that social element, I think, is what you're saying. The, the WhatsApp stuff's great, you know, Zoom calls, we've got things like that. The technology takes you so far, but actually being in a room with your friend and someone you in, whose company you enjoy and rolling dice and the, the stories that that tells, you know, that doesn't translate over technology. That needs to be something that happens, you know, person to person. Yeah. I mean, all the bits that you've mentioned there and, and filming... Uh, I can I do all of those with people and uh, the WhatsApp on the phone and loads of different groups and my own community. Um, But there's something extra special and personable about doing it with someone that you've known for 30 years (laughs) rather than someone that you've just met on the Internet. There's you can. There's, there's layers to this hobby, and that's another layer, I think. Because, I mean, there are forums and groups and places for everyone to go where they can chat 40K uh, online. But there's there's something very personal about, about doing it with a friend. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I'd, I'd agree with that. So, you know, if we may sort of touch upon it, obviously, you put out a video about nine months ago about the positive... I suppose influence that Warhammer has had on improving your mental health and as as you put it at the time saving your life um as somebody who has puts a similar 
aspect to Warhammer in, in, in the hobby, because, you know, without being able to paint and make and play with these miniatures, I would probably be, I don't even know what, I'd probably be a gibbering wreck, if not worse. Um, because the, the mental health aspect, the, the calm, the mindfulness that the hobby brings, the escapism of being in a game or the escapism of, you know, talking about it with your friends can sometimes be all you need to stop you from going down that, that, that dark corridor. So, you know, something I don't think is quite stated enough in this hobby is just how good it can be for a person's mental health. Yeah, and yeah, it can be. And everyone in the hobby is creative as well. So everyone is uh, fairly open-minded. It's, it's a hobby that actually naturally draws the more creative type people into it. Um, even if you're just playing uh, the game, you're obviously, if you, even if you're playing the game and you're not building miniatures and painting miniatures, and if you're just playing the game, it's still a game of toy soldiers and it's still war games and it's still got fantasy miniatures or sci-fi miniatures in it. So it naturally draws more creative people. And I think uh, creative people as well uh, tend to be, uh, they're more open-minded and they, yeah. Uh, I don't know, I, want, I was thinking, are our hobby group more prone to, I don't know. It is a great thing for mental health. <laughs> I think, I think I hobbies think are a great thing for mental health. I'm not sure if people in our hobby are more prone to these things than other types, but maybe I, I they think, are because they're creative. I don't know. I think it's it's not necessarily the people in the hobby. I think the hobby attracts people. So I'm a massive comic book nerd. Probably the only thing I love more than Warhammer is my Batman and DC comics. Um, and that in the world and uh, comic book movies and comic book series they have their booms when the financial crisis or there's a great depression in terms of in, in a country that's when comic books and that sort of escapism booms um and so there's a there's a correlation there in terms of the escapism i think and i think that's something the hobby offers it offers some kind of escapism no matter which aspect you do it's an escapism of yeah. from you know work that day or a stressful situation or a family drama or whatever other world stuff might be going on whatever you're mm. doing with that hob with this hobby is an escape and it, it can be a great leveler as well you know you, you can have nothing in common with someone except this hobby and you can sit and have a really good conversation with them you know and you can meet someone for the first time and see they've got a you know a warhammer shirt on or they're, they're carrying a, a, a figure case and you know you've got something you can talk to that person about. And I think it was one of the comments in your videos, uh, in the video Wolby's talking about, Winters, when someone said it's a brotherhood, you know, and, and or a personhood, I should say. But it's a common thing that we all have. You know, we've all got this interest, and we've all got an interest in maybe a completely different aspect of it, but there's something in there that we can all, you know, be in touch about. And you can meet people for the first time, and sit and talk to them for you know for an hour and just think wow what a cool person to have met and i never would have met them except for this hobby you know it draws all these different people together and it's it's great it's, i've never known another hobby like it for being that you know uh, pity to bring people together yeah it does it yeah it, it doesn't matter who you are where you're from what you do doesn't matter who you are, <laughs> where you're from. I it knew just that was matters coming. What I, you're I, playing I, I, and why that. you're playing it. Yeah, what what dice you throw? Why are you painting Tau? Who knows? You know things. That's you can immediately talk about the army straight away. So yeah, yeah. I like it. I think yeah, and obviously, and you can awesome. You can always find your level with a with a person as well because they might not be the biggest. You know um not have the biggest knowledge of the law for example but they're really good at painting or they might not be the best painter or might not enjoy the painting but they know the law you can always find something within the hobby where you can have yeah. a deep fleshed out conversation like like yeah. carl said i don't know of another hobby where that level can possibly exist it just we're lovely aren't we as, as a general <laughs> community yes i will say so so speaking of being lovely um, obviously, right. as I mentioned and as mentioned, most of these things I do solo. I invented it. I just do it solo. However, because it was you and because Carl wanted to be a little bit of a fangirl, he <laughs> has scripted up some questions that I suppose right. 
he's always wanted to ask you. Um, <laughs> so I'm going to hand over this portion to Carl um, to to put some forward some questions. He ran them by me yesterday, and they are fantastic questions, better than I've ever written for any previous show. So I've got nice. my new questions writer. So <laughs> so no pressure. So no that, pressure. That English no degree, pressure. Yeah, the English degree I did, you know, 20 years ago is finally coming good. Um, good. <laughs> yeah, if, it's, if it's cool, buddy, I'll just run you through. And these are, there's no timing on this, so feel free to ramble and, you know, grab something and run with it. Right. Um, it's all good. So uh, first one is, if you could travel to any point in time in the 40K universe, where and when would you go? So you're basically being projected there and you can just watch what happened. You can't be killed or, you know, thrown into a sun or anything. It's just to be there and experience something as an event. So watch something. Yeah, you could watch the Emperor and Horus um, fight. You could yeah. watch the start of the heresy. You could watch the Emperor's origins. You okay. name it. So does it have to be 30K to 40K? Because I think I would very much like to go to the Dark Age um, of technology. Um, so you're looking about M25, something like that, before the uh, war with the men of iron and the men of gold and um, abominable intelligence and the, all of that sort of stuff. I'd very much like to see humanity at the peak and what was happening there in the 40k verse. But I guess that's a cheat mode because then I guess it isn't 40k. I guess the emperor isn't in it and you could be in Mass Effect or you could be in mm. any sci-fi. It could be Star Trek. Hmm. So no, I can't be there. I've answered my own question there. It's not there. <laughs> it has to be somewhere, something else. Um, hmm. This is very interesting because uh, my mind immediately goes to Isman 5, the drop site massacre. That'd be a glorious thing to see, but also a terrible thing to see, but obviously mm. a glorious thing to see. We like war. Um, <laughs> <laughs> That's why we do this. Uh, a tyrannid invasion of a planet. That would be quite interesting to see. Oh, good shout. Yeah. Um, nowhere near the eye of terror, because once that goes in your brain, I don't think it ever comes out of your brain. Um, I did wonder once about the actually going to see the Golden Throne. What would happen if you could see the Golden Throne? But Dan Abnett kind of answered that in an interview once mm -hmm. where he said you would immediately die, basically. But if you could get there, it would be like staring into the heart of a nuclear furnace where something that once resembled a throne but isn't, uh, inside something that once resembled a throne but isn't and never was, is something that once resembled a man but isn't and never was and it would be bright and it, it, it would be unbelievably bright and the order tree the the sounds of the place would be overwhelming and just and so it kind of yeah the heart of a nucleus so i don't want to go to the golden throne because i've got my answer <laughs> from dan abner um it's fan it's fan five the drop site massacre popped into my mind that that I don't think there's been another, mind you, the Siege of Terror. No, because the Siege of Terror, there's not one huge moment. It's just huge and ongoing and you couldn't capture the whole thing. But the the Urgle depression being above, yeah. See, mind, actually, no, one minute. The Triumph of Ullinor, it's already my that favorite isn't answer. good. It's, it's such a good question because it's so expansive. <laughs> the, the answer is better than the question. Sorry, we're just... What about the Triumph of Ullinor? What do you think? Where would you go? Oh. Now that's a good, I haven't prepared for that, as you can probably tell. <laughs> well, whilst whilst Carl prepares, he tried this. He tried this question out on me yesterday, and being that even though I don't um, have any more um, in terms of uh, uh, the space wolves, the big thing that I would perhaps want to see is the decision making on both sides when Logan Grimnar and the Inquisition are facing off. Almost like, you know, how did that all just come to a head, like from both sides? I think I would love to be able to watch, you know, almost both command centers, if you will. You mean, is that after the first War of Armageddon? Yeah. yeah. I, think, um, I think that, that, that was for me, just, just, you know, it showed the Inquisition to be, you know, it was one of the first, or one of the biggest people to strike back at the Inquisition and say, you're not as powerful as you think you are. I, I, I dare you to come at me, bro, sort of thing. And I think that was, um, 
it was a good fronting up. And I think it was just something that didn't really happen a whole lot before. Mm. And Logan Grimnar teleported across to that Grey Knight strike cruiser he and did. the head off of a Grandmaster. He did. And he <laughs> just yeah. stood there and watched. <laughs> On his own battle barge and said, this stops, this ends now. Yeah, I They are the you. Emperor's executioner after all. That's what they're bred to do. So... Um, I think I thought of an answer, actually, um, and it's probably not one that I, maybe people would expect, but um, the birth of Slanesh, so the moment that the Eldar civilization fell, because I think witnessing the birth of a god might be quite um, epic, for want of a better word. Okay, but be they're not answer. gods. No, they're not. They're true. They're, they're Humani the worst aspects of, of humanity made manifest, essentially. Um, but yeah, that might be it. That might yeah, be that it. Yeah, cool, yeah. Yeah, that would be pretty cool. Um, yeah. But yeah, I appreciate the answer is fantastic. And you, you went to a lot of places which were great. Um, and and Wolvie and I actually had that conversation about the Dan Abner interview in the Golden Throne um, last night when we were sort of talking, prepping for this. Um, and that was my second favourite part of the interview he did, with the first yeah. favourite part being um, Magnus is a dick and then laughing, which is a space wolf, was my favourite. <laughs> um, so second question is um, very much more prosaic. Uh, who would you want to go for a beer with from Games Workshop? So from anybody in their history, you could just go to the pub and just shoot the shit and ask some questions. Dan Abner. He's a Good great job. conversationalist as well. And all the podcasts and all the interviews and the Black Library events, he can't shut up. He <laughs> just talks and talks and talks. Uh, he's incredibly creative. He's got some great ideas. So he'd be a great person to go to a, the pub with. He would, he would talk your ears off. Very good. ADB needs a bit of time to go. It would be a writer. It would definitely be a writer. So Dan Abner, rather than a rules writer or any of the, yeah, it'd, it'd be a writer. Awesome. You? Um, well, Wolvie, you answered this last night, didn't you, when I was running you through this? I did. Um, I said Chris Rate. He's my favourite writer, I think. Is he? All, all, all of my, all of the books that he's written, I think, are the ones that I, I don't know, I seem to be able to read the easiest, I seem to find the best. He's just, he's just my favourite writer. So, okay. in yeah. terms of yeah. going for a beer with a writer, it would, yeah, it would be him. And I'm I, currently I, reading one of his books right now. I forget what it's called. It's the one in the, the, a Hive City, Probator in a Hive City. Um, forget what it's called. Anyway. <laughs> but yeah, I, I, I think exactly. the tri triumvirate of writers, I think it would either be Dan Abner or, um, or ADB because you could ask them a question and just sit there and, and drink your beer and enjoy their answer. Yeah. Um, fantastic. So the third one, if you could find out, if you had the opportunity to find out what happened to the, the lost Primarchs from the first founding, so that the second and 11th chapters of Marines have been expunged from Imperial Records, would you want to, or do you prefer the mystery? Um, I think I'd like to know. I think it, most people would like to know, and I think they will tell us eventually. I think that's part of they're going to reveal that at some point. I, I, I do believe. I think one of them got executed by the Emperor's executioners because when the space wolves were sent to um, brain fart, Prospero. Thing, Prospero, when they were sent there, yes. <laughs> they. Uh, I think um, Lemurus said he'd done it before. This is not the first time it happened. So we know that one of them were executed. I, it, it would, I'd be very surprised if the second one wasn't folded into the Ultramarines at some point in their past. Um, but that could just be the fact that Gulliman's so well organized that their, his legion was so large. One of, one of them could have just been very, very bad. I mean, we've got the sliding scale, right, of the 18 legions. And we've got some at one end of the scale up to Lorgar and the Knight lords and then we've got the other end of the scale which is Gulliman and the ultramarines and maybe um the imperial fists for example so there's there's a scale there um but the scale didn't have to end at the night lords <laughs> it, it clearly didn't it went further than that and if you look at the primarchs at that end of the scale um they're not 
some of them turned to Horus because they wanted to. Some of mm. them just went, yeah, this is a great idea. Let's do this. So, yeah, at the upper end of the scale, there's going to be some really, really nasty things going on. I think Games Workshop are going to do that at some point. There's money in it, and Games Workshop love money. Uh, mm. We love giving Games Workshop our money. So they'll, they'll do it, I think. And I, okay. I'd like to find out. Okay, awesome. Good answer. Um, is there any particular rule or mechanic that you would change from 40K on a sort of fundamental level? Um, I've been in the hobby so long, I've seen the rules and change a lot. So it's not a rule or there. I, I couldn't point at one thing. There is a rules thing that I would change though on a fundamental level. Um, if I was the CEO of Games Workshop, um, there would never be any rules supplements which contain rules in outside of the codex. So to play the game, you need the rule book and you need your codex and that's it. I'd never release um, Vigilus or Charadon or whatever it's called. I'm looking at down there. Yeah, Charadon, Act One, The Book of Rust. Uh, I'd never release um, those mm. Rise of the Phoenix books. What are they called? Saga of the Beast and all of those ones. Oh, that yeah. is something that I think is fundamentally bad for the game. Um, layers of complexity can be added by... Um, what? Here's, here's an idea. W wouldn't it be awesome if there was a codex for your army that didn't have any rules in it? Say it was like the... Say it was like the... I don't know. Um, the... The library of your own. Say you collect space marine, space walls, right? So you've got the rule book and you could get the space walls narrative book. And in it would be all the narrative about all the space walls. They wouldn't need to have to update that one very much. They could update that one every five or 10 years. But say um, the space walls rule book came out once a year, every year, and it cost a tenner. So all the factions got a book all the time. Um, that's what I'd like to see. So not a rule, but a the whole rules. <laughs> I'd like the whole rules in one place all the time. I think that's a great answer. And I think that would be a very popular answer as well. I think a lot of people would like to see that structure. I would. Yeah. Yeah. I think that there are there are gaming companies out there that have adopted that. I certainly know, you know, Mantic Games for Kings of War. They tend to keep everything in one book. You know, I've got the, I've not played them very much, but I've got the Batman miniature game and the Harry Potter miniature game from Night Models. And they've got all their rules in a book. And they've obviously just got the, like the character cards for individual perks and traits. Um, mm. But all those perks and traits are in the rule book. So yeah. just everything comes in that one rule book. And that's all you need. You need the rule book and the dice yeah. to play. And that's, and you're good to go. Um, but Another way to do it, John. No, so I don't say, but GW love money. Another way to do it is every time a new edition came out, comes out, like when ninth edition came out, is they could release indexes again. Right now, there's mm -hmm. a bunch of people waiting for their codexes anyway. We haven't got the Orcs one. We haven't got this one. We haven't got that one. So every time they launch an edition, why can't they say, right, all the rules before they're gone, here's the five indexes, and then you wait for your code. That's another way to do it. So you'd get a codex per edition at some point, or they could release them quite quickly. I don't Indexes at the start of every edition would be good. I'd be willing to put up with that. Um, but yeah, too much rules bloat. Rules bloat and Games Workshop go hand in hand. <laughs> and, it was and one many... shining moment. It was eighth edition before Vigilus came out. Eighth edition dropped. The indexes came out and then one by one by one, they released all the codexes. It was lovely. And there was a point for about two months where everyone had a codex. There was nothing in White Dwarf. There was the rule books and the codexes. And then Vigilus came out. And then there was some stuff for um, the assassins in a White Dwarf. And then, yeah, but for about yeah. two months there, that was the best 40K I ever played. <laughs> Which, yeah. which proves it can be done. It's just not done, you know? Yeah. Because games but won't no, drop great. money. I'm just going to keep... <laughs> Recurring theme, right? Yeah. Of course. Um, if you could speak to the sculptors at GW and they could make a miniature for you, not of you necessarily, but just for you that isn't in the game yet, so you could say, I want X model to be made for this range, what would you pick? Uh, Imperator class Titan. 
<laughs> there was no hesitation there straight oh, in that was that was yeah that was very direct and to the point but again imagine that product. though imagine that they i don't know because the warlord titan was a practice in sculpting and engineering genius it took them a long time to design and make it work without it collapsing on itself. I've got a Reaver Titan and that thing weighs eight kilograms. I've no idea how heavy the Warlord is. Um, I don't know how they could make an Imperial class Titan, but imagine if they did. Imagine it would come up to your, it would, it would be tall. <laughs> it would be like a meter <laughs> tall, meter and a half tall. But imagine if it was in plastic rather than in resin and imagine if you could buy it. There would be some people out there that would buy it and have it stood in the corner of their living room, oh, towering over the tea. It would look epic. Come oh, on. Without that, you could literally just have it plonked beside your gaming table. Yes. <laughs> you wouldn't even have to deploy it on the table if you ever used no. it. You just deploy it next to it. <laughs> he, yes. could, he could hold your beer. It would be amazing to be like oh, having yeah. someone to play with. You'd, yeah. want, you'd want opposable hands for it, wouldn't you? You'd want just to be able, for it to be able to grip stuff. And... <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I don't, they don't even have to release rules for it just because, I mean, there would be some crazy people who try and play. I do remember Apocalypse Rules back in 6th edition. They did release rules for the Imperator's Class Titan for those that had scratch built them. Um, and they were crazy. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, just I've, have faced, I've only ever faced a Titan once and that was enough. And that was just a basic, like I said, I think it was a Reaver Titan. I don't think it was a, like one of the big ones. It was just... It was nuts, it was absolutely nuts. Like, what do you do? What do you do against it? <laughs> Which is actually quite thematic, isn't it? Because if you were facing the Titan, you would get stepped on and, and killed. Yeah. And that's kind yeah. of what happened on the table. So, yeah. Um, cool. Um, you're doing great. We've only got three left. So I hope these haven't <laughs> been too left field for you. Um, Thank you. If you picked, uh, we've kind of covered this already, but if you picked a part of the hobby, which was your favourite, and away from your kind of your channel and the fact that you, you know, you do this for, for a living. So just you as a hobbyist, do you prefer to pay to uh, to play, to paint, to list build, to just talk law and hang out with your friends and talk about the game? So away from the camera, what's your your favorite thing to do? Um, I like away from the camera, the most favorite thing to do is all of it. Um, I enjoy playing the game with my friends. I enjoy sitting and talking with my friends, drinking coffee. I enjoy, I enjoy painting. Um, uh, I'm not as good as I used to be. I've, I've um, had a, a problem with my eye. Um, so it's a bit like painting drunk since um, that's what it looks like to me. So I'm not very good at um, uh, edge highlighting and some of the details that I used to be, but I can still do washes and dry brush and I can still, I can still make a model look pretty good. And the setup here is very bright and light and it's, it's so I, I but I enjoy painting. I enjoy painting with my friends. I enjoy talking 40K. I enjoy it all. What do I enjoy the most? Uh, I don't know. It's such a, a big homogenous lump for me. Um, also, I'm not very good at the most sort of things because I'm quite. Because, mm, mm. <laughs> you know, one day it might be I'm really enjoying painting this model. And then the next day it might be this is a fantastic game. I'm really enjoying this game. The next day it might be going to see someone somewhere and talk to them about something. I actually enjoy the, the business side of things as well. Um, a couple of days ago, two days yesterday, two days ago, I went up to Nottingham to talk to James from March of War and uh, they're setting up a gaming hall up there and it's not opening yet. It's, it's open at the middle of July. I oh, know the end of, end of June. So opening at the end of June and they're building all the terrain for it and setting up this place. It's called tabletopevents.co.uk. I don't even know if the website's live yet. And just going there and talking to those guys and seeing where they are with their, with their business and when it is open, how exciting they are and looking at all the bits of terrain they had made. That was fun too. And uh, I'm very privileged in the fact that I get to do that. Um, uh, Cause I know people like that. And then when I, ring and say can I come up they'll go yeah so let's go so I love that too um I enjoy podcasts and talking to people about the hobby this is fun 
I don't know what I enjoy most. What do you enjoy most? Answer the question. One thing. <laughs> I'm incredibly happy to take that as the answer. I think that's covered everything. So that it can be but everything. You answer it then. How hard is this? This is a hard question. What do you enjoy the most? Everything. I'm going to steal your answer. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But it's you're awful. right. You, you, can't, you can't isolate it because, as you say, one day... It can be painting the next day. It can be looking forward to um, a game. I've, I'm playing Wolby on Saturday, um, and it's going to be our first game in over a year, and I, I'm I'm so excited about that. It's fantastic. So it's looking forward to talking about afterwards everything. So when you're playing on Saturday, what you're playing? Uh, match play, narrative play, open play. What you're doing? Uh, it's going to be Wolby's first run out with his Eldar, so right. it's going to be two K matched play, I think. And I'm taking the. I've been playing the Orcs a lot, um, so I'm taking the Space Orcs out for a spin, um, just so I don't forget about them. Yeah, okay. I've, I've, I've started a couple of armies in lockdown. I've, I've started Eldar and I've started Grey Knights. Um, so it's a good chance to kind of just use a match play to kind of get out, get used to the mechanics of Eldar, although it's probably going to change with the Codex in the next few months, but yeah. um, get used to using them. I've never had an Eldar army before, so I, you know, getting used to saying what their weapons are called, like the shuriken cannons and stuff. It's just getting used to how they play, and you know, perhaps not doing what I would usually do with things like space walls or death guard in the past, which is just get it moving up the board and get everything into combat and just smash because they can hold their own. Yeah. You have to be a little bit more savvy with Eldar. So I'm looking forward to to trying that out. Cool. Good luck. <laughs> Thank I, you. I'm probably yeah. going to need it. I've, I've um, realised. I realise I don't take very sophisticated armies because Space Wolves and Orcs are both pretty much get up the table and hit people in the face with something big and heavy. But, you know, works for me. Um, awesome. So, uh, penultimate one. You can ask the Emperor one question and he has to tell you the answer. What would you want to ask him? I can't say. Okay. Mysterious. <laughs> That's, that's very mysterious. I like it. <laughs> that is. That's a good answer. Okay. I like that there is um, one. There clearly is one, but you can't say. Yeah. I mean, hey. So, okay, cool. <laughs> um, this, one is, this one is very much probably the most uh, out there one, but it's the last one. You'll be pleased to know. So, if you had to play against death to save your soul, so he suggested chess. You said, you know what? I'd rather play 40K. He says, fine. What army would you use and what kind of list would you run? Um, Death Guard, 60 Pox Walkers, 18 Blight Lord, no, 18 Death Shroud Terminators, Triple Plague Burst Crawlers. Make sure that you've got the <clears throat> Noxious Blightbringer in there with the Putres Revolting Stench Bats, um, Relic, uh, yeah, that list. That's probably the toughest list that I I know right now. As, hey, as, I think that, you... that, that started off sounding a lot like the list I used this past weekend when I took on um, some custodies. I uh, I'm still unbeaten against custodies. I keep liking to put that one out there. <laughs> um, but though, it literally started with sixty pox walkers. It started with all the terminators that I've got, both the blight lord and the death shroud. I had typhus in there. I had the foul blight spawn. I had all the all the all the all the guys in there just buffing and doing this and yeah it's they are I, I wouldn't have said this because it was the first time i'd used death guard since the new codex it's the first time i had the opportunity i wouldn't have said that pox walkers were better than they used to be before playing the game now i played that game pox walkers are better than they used to be which um which play company did you run out as um i want to say because it's the Typhus one, isn't it? It's the Harbingers? Yes. It was either that or the Inexorable. I can't remember. I ran one of those two. Was it the Harbingers? The, what, you re-roll hits with the Poxwalkers? I think that so, one. yes. Although none of them got into combat. I didn't need them to. Okay. Um, I yeah, that's used, them, used them as board coverage and objective holding, and I just split them into different no, areas. No, you need to be aggressive with them. Um, with the... Uh, re-roll hit rolls and you also stick on um, the mutant strain on them 
And so they're doing mortal wounds in close combat. And then you re-roll it. Six is the hit, cause mortal wounds and re-roll all hits. Pick up your one to fives, re-roll all of them, even though fours and fives hits, because mm. you can. And then the biologus purifier, putrefier is re-roll uh, wound. So six is the hit, do uh, mortal wounds. And then you've got one which does six is to wound, does mortal wounds, not on poxwalkers, but on your death shroud. And stick it on them. And then re-roll all of them with um arch contaminator yeah so you can put out a lot of mortal wounds but i'm the narrative guy so i don't know these things <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that all sounds great until death puts a plastic imperator titan on the table and then yeah. you're in trouble i mean yeah. i don't know if you've got that enough you know that many points that you're going to play with a with an imperator titan you've got thousands of pox walkers that you can suddenly start just throwing at it <laughs> Yeah. So <laughs> and you just put typhus just behind them just to give them that extra, you know, extra toughness. You, and could, just... you could do the World War Z thing when you build a wall of zombies up to the top of yeah, the yeah, Titan yeah. and then have someone run up and just, you know, kill the, the princeps. That's yeah. exactly what would happen. Just the, this one little poxwalker just climbing up and just jumps into the cockpit and just goes, right, let's let's have it. Yeah. Nice. Um, good, but, what you no, that, do? That's great. Thank you for your answers, buddy. That was awesome. Cool. So, was there one more? Um, there isn't, but there can be. Oh, oh I've, okay. I've, I've, I've still got some. Don't worry. I've, okay. You know, we're, we're not, we've not run out I yet. Was, <laughs> I thought you said penultimate. I thought, oh, there's some more coming. Cool. Um, no, okay, good. So in terms of then, um, obviously, what you would um, play as, what armies do you enjoy facing the most? Orc. Orcs are fun. Everyone likes playing orcs. They're away. Playing against them, playing with them. Orcs are fun. Tyranids are fun. Genes are... Horde armies are good to play against because of the high body count. Do you notice the lower the body count, people tend... people. So knights aren't popular to... Well, all the armies are popular, but knights and custodies are amongst the least popular armies for people to play against in general. Um, particularly from the comments that I get and the communities I'm involved with. Uh, and I think that's to do with body count. And when you go up against lists that have high body counts and you see lots of stuff down, die, that's fun to play against. So orcs, uh, bugs, anything with a high body count is great fun. Because yeah, you I can actually see your stuff do stuff. When you've got a low body count and you throw all your shooting in at some custodies and they don't fail a three up in vulnerable save, um, then <laughs> and you, maybe one model gets picked up. That can be a little bit frustrating sometimes. Yeah, mm. I think I think you're right. I think even if you lose, but if you can look over at the counter and see, you know, you've picked off 40, 50 miniatures or whatever it might be, you still feel like you've had a good day. You can still stand there and pick an MVP. If you've gone yeah. and bounced off an army, like you say, knights or custodies, whatever it is, if you've gone and bounced off them, you kind of go, well, yeah, what did I do? I didn't do anything. So, yeah. Great I time. think it's part of that sort of social contract, isn't it? When you're gaming, you know, is, is you you play to have a good time, but you also play for your opponent to have a good time. And if they're not enjoying themselves, it takes the enjoyment away from you as well. You know, we, we're in this to be to have a mutually sort of beneficial time, you know, and, and have fun. Um, and and what I think people really respond to about your your channel wins is is that you have the narrative running through everything. You know, your boards are always absolutely fantastic and beautiful and themed and the story um, weaves its way through the whole battle, you know, and, and that I think is what people respond to is the fact that it looks like fun and it, you know, yeah. you know, it's fun. Yeah. And if I could sort of chime in on that, I think one of the, one of my favorite things about how you present um, on your show is there's no wasted shot, essentially, <laughs> you know, a missile could miss and on a lot of channels, it's just, and that's a miss, but you don't, you don't do it like that. You don't leave it like that. You, you add something about that missile missing, or you add something about, you know, that the attack bouncing, you, you add something a little extra for someone who in, really enjoys narrative stuff. Uh, you know, something that's, that's a part of your channel. I really enjoy. Thank you. Yeah. Cause the dice, the dice are telling a story. So if you roll 10 ones, something horrible just happened. <laughs> And if you roll, three, you know, if you, the six to hit and then the six to wound and then D6 damage and you roll a six, 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 one minute. No, and then the thing <laughs> blows up, something glorious. That was the glorious shot. Um, so the dice are telling the players a story all the time. So I try, that's what I believe. So I think that's what I pick up on. Um, the thing that Carl said about the fun factor though, that 
resonated with me because um, one of my things, you have the most amount of fun playing a game when your opponents are having the most amount of fun. So I'm sure you've both been in a room playing Monopoly and been slightly drunk and people are really trying hard and, uh, and there might be a little bit of cheating in the background. Those games of Monopoly suck. But the games of Monopoly, when you're in the room and everyone's laughing their head off, everyone's drunk, chips are flying all over the place. You don't really care who wins. You probably don't get to the end. That's the most amount of fun, right? When your opponents are really enjoying themselves are when you have the most fun too, because it is a social contract. It is a shared thing. So I really try and have fun when I'm playing. Winning comes, it's nice to win, but it comes second. Uh, yeah, or think, third or fourth. I it think, comes I think way down. That, I think when fun you, is the most important thing. Yeah, when, when when you look back to games that you remember or moments from games that you remember, it's never oh I won this game or I won that game. I I don't necessarily remember that. Although I actually keep a book, I keep a log of all of the <laughs> games because I'm that guy. But um, you know, the things I remember is you know um, there was a, a game uh, just over a year ago I think where. You know, Mephiston and Ragnar Blackmane, they were facing off. It was me against a, a friend of mine doing Blood Angels. They, you know, they, they were smashing in. And everybody, like Carl and all the rest of the people in the group, stopped and came to watch Ragnar and Mephiston face off. And they killed each other. And that was glorious. Um, nice. And, like, it, it's those sorts of things where, you know, it came, I remember one game it coming down to, like, some of the last dice rolls and I had a wolf lord and he was in a piece of terrain. He was standing on an objective. If I held that objective to the last, to the end of the turn, I won the game and he was standing off. He was surrounded. And it was just, it was just one of those moments where again, people from the gaming club that I was playing at, at the time all sort of stopped because they knew something was something big or some sort really cool was about to happen. Those yeah. are the moments that stick out. It's not, I, I lost that game. The wolf lord got absolutely obliterated, but there was that chance that he could stand firm and that would have been a really cool thing. It was cool anyways, but um, yeah. it's Heroic those things that stand out, isn't it? You and your grot, yeah. pal. You can tell Winter's all about the, the, the night oh, slapping I wasn't going to mention that. <laughs> Go on then. Um, so we had a game of my orcs against um, Wolby's Nurgle and he brought a Nurgle Chaos Knight and um, I got into combat with it with some Gretchen because, you know, uh, as you do, and one of them is the model that's holding a stick bomb above his head. And yeah. he rolled a six to hit, a six to wound, and then Wolvie failed his armor save on his knight. And the grot hit the knight in the ankle with a stick bomb and took a wound off it. Um, and I decided that he would be the first recipient of the golden stick bomb. So he's now got nice. a gold grenade that he carries around with him, waving it above his head because he took a wound off a chaos knight. And it's little things like that. He will forever be the grot with the golden grenade. And I know how he got that. And Wolvie yeah. knows how he got that. So it's that little moment of glory. He probably got sat on by a war bus after the battle or fed to a squig hound or something horrible happened to him. But for that brief shining moment, he was the bravest brat who ever lived. Yeah, we have that. We, do you have that saying where your um, models earn themselves a name when they've done something so glorious? It's like, I have to name this thing now. Yeah. Usually yeah, they yeah, earn like it. a gold stripe or like Carl said, they earn like a gold um, yeah. stick bomb. Usually, something like that. I, I think one of our other friends did something with an electro priest and that electro priest has now got like gold trim on his armor because Brilliant. he because he earned that that's kind of what we do in our group we sort of either put um something on the base um i think one of my models has got an orc head on the base yes it is it's this guy here it's the carl bought me a chaos lord the, uh, the kindness of his heart he bought me a chaos lord um and he was like, there you go you can you know i love this model i want to see it painted so there you go so I painted it up and I brought it against him, which is the decent thing to do. Yeah. And bearing in mind the Chaos Lord at the time, they, you couldn't give them um, disgustingly resilient. He just stood there and he withstood 14, I think, attacks without taking a single wound. Nice. Uh, like 14 wounds without taking a single. And he's now got an orc head on his base to signify that game because he was disgustingly resilient without ever having the rule. Yeah. Nice. Until until he caught a rocket in the face and then he wasn't very resilient anymore. But no, probably, <laughs> you know. probably your tank busters because there's nothing I hate more on this earth than tank busters. No. Nice. Do you guys do you have names for your warlords? Have you given them names? I I, I have got my war boss has got a name. My stomp has got a name. Um, and uh, there's some of my characters have. Yeah, my wolf okay. my wolf characters tend to because part of the draw for me for space wolves is the 
the kind of the law and the sagas and the telling of stories and boasting and and building this you know this yeah. story building your thread so yeah yeah so and I've, I've only i've only named my uh, death guard ones so far but I'm, I'm quite proud of some of their names like the surgeon is dr leper nice um i've got mumpus poxkin uh, which is a demon nice. prince i've got shit lips which is a uh <laughs> malignant play caster because he's got brown around his lips um alakazam the infected is another one um what is it called now uh, mr baubles is the guy with the blight racks and all the yeah. all the grenades um i'm trying to find the rest of them now fest of the pestilent Ooh. which is my great unclean one um so fluffy and rex are my beasts of nurgle so i've named quite a few of them i just fluffy. think Fluffy and Rex. Yeah. So I just think that, yeah, I think it's quite I've noticed fun. that Beasts of Nurgle and Demon Princes tend to get the least scary names. You know, <laughs> they're, they're, they're called Steve or Rob or Bob or yeah. Fluffy or Pinky or something. Yeah. Well, yeah. The, my um, Noxious Blightbringer, which is obviously the guy with the bell, he's called um, Bilbo Bell Blight. Just, nice. I don't know why, these names just come to me and I just... <laughs> the names are good, though. I... I I reckon th that's one of the things I recommend to new people in the hobby. Name your warlords to give them. A, it changes the it changes your army a little bit. It changes your connection with your army a little bit. It's the single easiest thing that you can do, which actually gets you more invested with the army that you have and the miniatures on the table. So I'm glad to hear that you you guys do it. It's good stuff. I've not named any of my Eldar or any of my Grey Knights yet, but when they actually hit the table is generally when they, I come up with a name with them mid game. That seems to be how it happens. And cool. then it just, and then it just sticks. So that will probably be what happens to them if I'm honest. I've got to the point now where I deliberately don't name the new, like for the 13th, my space Marine chapter. If I'm introducing a new captain, I deliberately don't name them until they have done some, cause there's so many names now. Yeah. <laughs> so mm. actually <laughs> them. So I've named loads of stuff, which is good. And you should, but yeah, leaving a few things unnamed, the new things unnamed, let them earn themselves that name. Because you'll also remember the time when they earned that name, right? He is now Bob or Kevin or whatever. Yeah. And you'll remember giving him that name or her or it, if it's a yeah. slimy thing. <laughs> <laughs> you just described my whole Death Guard army. It's a slimy thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I wouldn't. I wouldn't want to check a beast of Nurgle by going around the back of it and seeing no. what it has. I'll just say it's a, it's a them. Yeah, it's yeah. a them. We'll just go with that. <laughs> so, obviously, you've taken, you've got the, the hobby at the next level. You 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 film now. Obviously, yes. like a lot of channels, as they go on, they start off on a mobile phone or with a small Canon camera, for example, and they go up in the world. They get all of this fancy technology and all these big old cameras and all the lighting rigs and the and the little microphones that sit here and all of that stuff but yes. you stick to what got you to where you are i understand yes. you still stick with an old like like a samsung mobile phone other mobile phones uh, are available this yes this is my recording device <laughs> that's what i use and i, I think um, that's awesome if i'm honest like that's we all any of us that have watched you watch you because of the content you put out there, the, the, the way you put across the game, your, your personality, obviously, your, you know, how, how you come across and the people that you play. But, you know, you, you forget that it's not filmed on a posh camera rig. You forget that it doesn't have graphics on the screen all the time. And this, well, well some of those things are great. I absolutely love play on tabletop. I think they're almost nfl style sports presentation is is funny as hell i sit there and laugh the whole i love it um but there's something still raw about yours like i could do that like i could pick up my phone and i can film a game and it's almost like i think you still provide that encouragement for others to do so well i hope so i'm not doing it because I'm very bad with tech. <laughs> Snap. <laughs> as, I, as I said, my wife set the whole thing up. She edited the first video and put it on the internet. And then um, she showed me and I was like, wow, I'm on the internet. Look at that. It's, <laughs> it's really good. And then um, I filmed an, and then she showed me how to do it. So the next time when my friends came around, I filmed another one and gave mm -hmm. her the phone again. And then she put that on the internet. I was like, wow, that's amazing. And then after I gave it to her the second time, she said, how many of these are you going to do? I said, I oh, don't know, one or two, <laughs> a few. 
I better show you how to edit it then. So she showed me how to edit it. And that was an exercise in pain. The editing software I use is the free window stuff. Liam from Deployment Zone, he's got the Adobe thingy bob full suite where you can do all the swishy stuff. Yep. And he's tried to show me how to use that. And um, I have access to it if I want to use it because it's on the web and we've got it as part of deploymentzone.tv's business thing. And there's far too many buttons and things and technical stuff. And I'm looking at going, it just blows my tiny brain. Um, so yes, I keep it simple. Also, the other thing is the cameras now, the camera quality on phones mm. these days is incredible. It's really good. I can do ultra high def 60 frames a second on this now. This is like a year and a half old. I don't know what, which one this one is, but the, it's really good. You don't need, she brought me a camera. <laughs> she bought me a camera once and I filmed one or two battle reports on it. But the second one, I, I, I wasn't, I was pressing the wrong buttons and it was, I screwed it up. So I, I got rid of that camera. I don't know where it is anymore because I couldn't, it had too many buttons on the camera. So yeah, um, I, I, it's down to me not being very good at tech, but it shows that there's so many different ways you can do it. Play on tabletop, do it a certain way. I do it a certain way. Uh, tabletop tactics to it a certain way there's loads of different ways that you can make content and stick it on the internet if i could do more of the swishy stuff i probably would but i know i'd screw it up i know if i started doing a bit here or there i'd probably get something wrong or i, I stick with what i know stick with what i'm good mm -hmm. at and yes that's me hi how are you <laughs> I think, like what we said, it it what I think a lot of people love about it is the the kind of rawness of it. You know, it's just you and your friend in your room with your phone filming a battle report. And I wouldn't ever want that to change, to be honest. And I I really appreciate that you haven't gone flashy, big cameras, oh, you know, all the rest of it, um, because it, it's like watching two of my mates play. You know, and I think that's one of the biggest compliments I can give you is that it looks it looks like my friends playing, which is a lovely thing. You know, it, it's part of that connection yeah i think i think oh, there was a, oh. sorry there was, there was there was a point in um the game you had against quipster the the orcs versus the imperial fists game. yes um and the, you just happened to see the floor and quipster's just there in his socks and i just thought that's <laughs> that's lovely that you, you know it's clearly in your house it's a you know a no shoe zone and I, and I love that yeah but um and i just thought that's like i say we all stand there in our socks or whatever and, and play warhammer i just thought that was just yeah. such a a fun touch a lot of people would have possibly edited that out but i just yeah I, and like carl says it's almost like watching just watching a couple of dudes play warhammer without bells and whistles like and you you know you get to know the people in the room you, you obviously you might that you don't know all of us but you know it's almost like that thing where we kind of get your personality as time goes on i think yeah it's just a really endearing quality well, i'm glad i'm glad that works because i have thought about it, it's one of those things that pops into my mind all the time like should i uh, for example, the, I've got the lighting rig up now that I bought for both corners, particularly over the winter. I was I was filming it in there for, it's behind that wall, filming in there for four years before um, COVID and the lighting rig. And I thought, right, let's get some proper lighting in. Um, so I, I've got that in there now, but I thought, and they're, they're cheap. They're like 30 quid. You can get them, clip them up, done. But I have thought about graphics and music and things so it's good to know that well carl said don't change it i think you said like leave it as is like like around your mate's house sort of feel so i that's good feedback because i yeah, am I, tempted I to try of, to at least try yeah this is obviously just the feedback of obviously just just two dudes out of the massive two community that, yeah. that, that, that follow you but you know i i you know I'm, i really enjoy them as they are because like i say there, there isn't you know all of these graphics there isn't all of this mad stuff happening it is very raw and very real and i think it does that that is more likely to encourage people like us for example to pick up a phone and film a bat rep rather than yeah. knowing well we can't afford that thousand pound camera and this 600 pound lighting rig that you've got above and all these little clippy special yeah. microphones all the you know which is great that stuff like that exists and we still watch you know tabletop tactics tabletop titans you know for um play on tabletop we still watch all those guys but there is still something that's quite raw and more accessible in terms of how it feels mm. it feels like a love-in for you now doesn't it the, uh, all these <laughs> No, no, it's 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 good. It's, it's yeah. Um, I'm glad. Yeah, and more. I, I yeah. 
<laughs> it, I'll, I'll put it this way. It feels like I've just gone out of the room to get a drink and come back in and I'm just watching you guys play, you know, yeah. which is lovely. And I think just that, like what we said, that connection is, is great. It's something to be, to be, you know, um, cherished. Yeah. Good. So it works. Lovely. <laughs> well, clearly it works. Sure but I have been, yeah, I was talking to the guys on play on tabletop. You know, they do that 40K in 40 minutes. Yes. Mm -hmm. It takes them 90 hours to edit one show on average. 90 hours I, of editing. I believe they've that. they've got multiple cameras set up. So they've got the top one. They've got, uh, I think it's four cameras. It's the, There's a top one. There's one at each side to look at each player. Yes, there is. Yeah. And then there's the gimbal camera, which they roam around. So there's four camera for four. And they don't cut filming like I do. I mean, this is... I basically edit while I'm playing. So, and this happened. And then, and it, you know, all those cuts in the thing, that's me stopping and starting this. Um, and what I'm doing when I edit is I, I trim bits off the beginning or end. Um, and sometimes I cut bits out, or sometimes, like when all of that dice rolling happened and one Gretchen died, it's that's when you get to the bit. And then he shot all of this stuff and a Gretchen died. I've cut out all that bit of filming that i just did yeah because it's boring watching five minutes of dice rolling for one gretchen dime for example but they've got all of that in and getting that down to a 40 minutes I, that sounds like hard work that doesn't sound like fun. Really so yeah but maybe those guys just really love editing so uh, editing software and that might be the, <laughs> bit of the hobby that they enjoy i can safely say that when i edit these videos i literally clip the start and i might clip the last few seconds off the end Unless yeah. there's a technical difficulty or the dog barks or needs a shit or something in the middle, <laughs> everything else just stays because, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm not the best when it comes to editing. I literally will put this into an editing thing. I've got like a screen that, immediately, that I can just drop in, change the names of the people on the um, thing and then voila, good to go. So nice. You know, it takes editing and uploading to YouTube takes less than an half an hour per episode. Nice. Um, so it's good to sometimes it, keep it simple. Yeah, and it's that accessibility thing as well. I think it's it's nice to watch. It's nice to watch things with incredible production values. It's like watching a Hollywood movie. You know, sometimes yeah. you want to watch the Avengers or you want to watch something epic, but other times you just want to watch something raw and you know something that just happens. And I'm aware that my hand keeps straying down here to stroke my cat because otherwise she'll jump on the screen and shove a bum in the in the camera. But <laughs> we're going to leave that in because was, that's what we do. Hundred yeah. percent. Like I say, I, that, that's, be, that's that's staying in if that happens. Um, nice. So coming into kind of, you know, the, the last few questions, don't want to take up all, all your time. Um, <laughs> Final run. So I want to talk about your open days because they look like ridiculous fun. I was watching the video. This was months and months and months ago of you slowly getting more drunk as you were filming going around the yeah. open day. And I was in stitches the entire time throughout that video because I thought, you're not gonna catch many other hobbyists doing this. It went from you asking how people are to just go, Steve, Steve. <laughs> and I just thought, this is just brilliant. This is just absolutely brilliant. I was, I was a bit rough the next day. <laughs> <laughs> I think that was at the end of the video. It showed you in the hotel room, perhaps not looking yeah. your finest. <laughs> uh, uh, uh. Um, yeah, I don't know what to say, really, other than I, <laughs> I thought I'd do a vlog, video log, vlog, one of them, yep. of the thing, um, and I didn't have much footage. <laughs> 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 so that's how it, well... I did have footage, but not much footage I could use. So that was about as, that's all I could really show. <laughs> well, I, I, I just thought, you know what, as a video, I thought that's just, it's just perfect. It's just brilliant. It's again, it's one of those things that keeps the channel that you're putting out there or the content you're putting out there raw and real. It's not, that wasn't mm. staged in any way, shape no. or form. There was no staged interviews. It was just you shouting at random people as you were going around the gaming hall and saying hi, you know? Yeah. And I just thought Basically. that was- and I don't know if you guys, so uh, uh, that obviously helps every person at the event feel even more included, I would imagine. I hope, Which, I hope so. You know, is, <laughs> is obviously the aim of the thing being an open I'm not, day. 
Yes. I'm not you, the winters that you see in battle reports and this winters and the winters in Tesco's is the the same. I <laughs> just I don't know how to so I'm I I am an idiot. I do like getting drunk. <laughs> don't we all if you meet me at an open day or on a, a thingy bob you'll it's the same person <laughs> buy me a beer oh 100 <laughs> like when when is your next when is your next one because you know i've, I've got to make it a, 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 an effort of mine to to get down there uh, well interestingly enough everything the next open day is going to be in 2022 because we tried to do COVID is a thing, basically, mm. and pushing it back and pushing it back, pushing it back. But in 2022, the plan is um, we want to do a at least three a year. Um, so either open day convention or narrative event uh, or all three, um, ideally all three. So an open day convention narrative event in 2022, yeah. then in 2023, then 2024. Um, I want to also get across to North America um, because the play on guys are in the deployment zone now and do some kind of convention with them. Um, and Mini Wargaming Dave's in Canada. So uh, we'll try and hook up with the vault as well with Mini Wargaming. So next year, but there are gonna be some smaller, lots of small little events this year, starting from the 3rd of July. There's, so this is gonna go up in the deployment zone. Um, by the time this video comes out, people in the deployment zone will know about it. But there's going to be one up near Nottingham and then one down near, I say one, it's going to be a monthly thing. And then one down south near Warminster, which is south of the M4 near Bath. So we've got one of the things that we're going to be doing is I'm determined for the deployment zone, not just to be extra videos. So here you go, subscribe and boom. Uh, I want it to be a community as well. Yeah. So Winters SEO is free. Everyone can watch Winters SEO. Fine. Um, YouTube's good fun. YouTube is a great way of interacting with the bigger, wider YouTube community and everyone out there. And Deployment Zone um, actually uh, put spread on the table. So what can I do? What can I, what more can I do to give back um, to these wonderful, wonderful people? So there's going to be lots of mini events happening around the country from the 3rd of July and I mean a couple of months every month where I will go to and get out there and play people. Um, uh, we're going to invade Warhammer World as well a couple of times towards the end of the year. That's a teaser. <laughs> so <I'll, laughs> when you say invade, I hope you're renting a day tank. next year. <laughs> that sounds awesome. That sounds yeah. great. Yeah, it'd be lovely. It would, I would like nothing better than to stand at Bugman's and buy you a beer. Absolutely, you can hold me to that. Uh, I would like nothing better than you buy me a beer as well. <laughs> <laughs> See, at, least, at least it's a two-way trade. Everybody gets what they want. <laughs> well, that, that kind of leads me into what would be my next question is about what your... Because obviously I, I asked earlier what your hobby target is for the remainder of this year, and you said, I've got loads. So what are I've your other loads. hobby targets over the next kind of 12 months or so? What, what, what is it you're, you're planning on doing in terms of yourself expanding the channel? Like what, obviously you've just said some stuff, but is there anything else? So, um, so the Gehenna campaign launches next month, which is an online campaign for the Deployment Zone community. So they can, wherever they are in the world, they can decide the fate of the Gehenna system. We've got a star system mapped up and all the factions are going to be there. There's a narrative reason why all the factions are there. And we're going to do updates, either weekly or bi-weekly updates as Gehenna, as Gehenna gets set on fire, essentially, and the yeah. Imperium rush to its aid. I'll also do some of my battle reports uh, on the channel and on YouTube uh, set in the Gehenna system. Um, I often set a lot of my fights in locations. Mm -hmm. I've been tinkling around in the Babington system and the Orpheus sector for a long time now. Um, so we're going to move to Gehenna. So the Gehenna online campaign is coming. Looking forward to doing that. Um, and who wins? We don't know. We've got some yeah. trailers, teasers. Out. We've got the community events coming. Um, that's really good. Uh, I've got Winter's Tournament Practice is a new series of videos that I'm going to do. Some of those are going to be on YouTube as well because I'm going to the No Retreat Legends event at the end of the year, and I want to practice my tournament list, lists. I've got two factions, Death Watch or Death Guard, and um, I've got a 
couple of ideas for a couple of lists and I've already done one of the games which isn't out yet need to edit it <laughs> and so people will see my lists evolve and how I end up settling on the final list at the end and I've actually had some oath of moments made up from James from March of War which you can't buy online you can only get these oaths of moment purity seals if you beat me in it for a winter's tournament practice because I want to lose a lot so I want to encourage the absolute worst list to come up against me because yeah. I need to learn and um, so that's happening those are the big three things. Uh, Den of Imagination are currently making a video series and they'll join us in the deployment zone. Steve from Vandegaard Tactics are also making a video series and they're going to come join us in the deployment zone. So the idea is the deployment zone grows and grows. So it's got community events online and offline and other people from the community inside it. And the idea of it growing is because I would like to employ my friends. I would like to get more people out of their factories and into this hobby. Um, that would be a good thing. But I'd also, I also want to, I really genuinely want to help the Warhammer community as a whole by having real events and doing, if there's more community, then there's more Warhammer more often uh there's more of us out there if the online community is bigger and making more stuff and yeah i think we're at the start of a wave i'm going to ramble I'll, I'll stop rambling but i think we're at the start of a wave a technological wave because of these i remember when i was young and probably carl remembers as well because he's got a bit of a gray beard there carl well done um, <laughs> when there was no such thing as cars or internet where everyone worked down the coal mine and rode horses to work and there was no <laughs> and if little jimmy down the street didn't play warhammer 40k you didn't play warhammer 40k and now we can play warhammer 40k with people all over the world and now there are battle reports online. Now Luton's online. Now there's audio books. So it's the, it's, we're at the start of this thing. This could get very bit. And also, back when me and Carl were working down the mine, um, you couldn't, it wasn't healthy for you all <laughs> to be a geek back then. <laughs> no. Geeks took over the world. I mean, Facebook and Amazon and all the, and Tesla, they're all geeks. And now you have Avengers and Game of Thrones and it's its okay to be a geek. It's okay to be nerdy. In fact, it's, it's super sort of, cool. In fact, it, people kind of expect it these days. Yeah, so it, I think it, we're at the beginning of a wave that. and I've got loads of things planned and lined up and I want to give back and help push surf that wave as much as possible. I mean, you're, you're obviously you're here helping us out by, you know, putting your face to, to, to one of our tiny little shows. And, uh, you know, that's something that, you know, it might get us some traction. People might look and go, no, I'm not interested. They'll probably be because of us and not you just throwing it out there. But, you know, it, give people the free choice of what they want to view, what they want to take in. And, you know, like you well, say, if you... there's more content, there's more. Yeah. Um, there's more people playing the hobby. There's more people doing the hobby, more people to talk to, more people to play. And that's what everybody wants right you know mm. surely <laughs> except for the gatekeepers but we don't talk about those um, <laughs> but imagine if there was 10 times as many people playing warhammer yeah yeah awesome. yeah absolutely i think the fact that that wolvie and i are sitting here talking to you is uh, shows the power of what can be done you know yeah. we met through instagram and the love of space balls and then we got playing and there was a point where Wolby came around to my house for the first time and didn't he didn't know me, I didn't know him, but we had this shared thing. And now we're talking to you and you're talking about this, this expanding that whole thing, you know. And, and yeah, like we said, everybody in this hobby, I think, wants it to be bigger and wants it to be better. And and the more people you've got in there, the more diversity you've got, the more different people coming into the community just helps it stay fresh, helps it grow. You know, they all bring something to the table. It's really it's great. Yeah. And yeah, that, absolutely. I think that's one of the one of the things I've mainly learned through doing, you know, up to episode 20 now. So I've done, you know, well, I've done 19 more of these. Um, the amount of different types of people that I've met doing these and is just fantastic. You know, men, women, people who identify as transgender, like all these people, again, all that stuff doesn't matter because we come together to push and paint toy soldiers. That's what we do. We push them on each other and, you know, we want to go to war with each other in the nicest way possible and then shake hands and have a lovely time. And I think 
you know, if you've got more people to play with, I didn't have a regular play group throughout all of my life. It's been very sporadic until the last couple of years when obviously I got very drunk in a foreign country and called Carl Colin um, during a, a text <laughs> conversation when we were talking about space wars and then happened to find out, oh, you live 20 minutes away from me. Well, let's, let's you know, meet up and have a smash up sort of thing. And I think, um, you know, it, it is a testament of the power of technology and being able to bring all these elements of the community together. Yes. <laughs> can't say anything can't say anything better than that can i can't really say anything better than that so that's the most succinct thing i think you've ever said winters that was great thank you. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so i will interject here with the final question and it's okay. the final question that i give everybody who comes on this okay. um it's quite a simple one what are your hobbies away from this hobby what else keeps you going when you're not painting or playing or talking or doing something with one. Um, I used to play a lot of video games, mm -hmm. like a lot of video games. Um, these days, I still play some video games, uh, but not a lot. Uh, it might take up four hours a week max, um, sometimes zero hours in the week. So I do play some video games sometimes uh but not a lot so uh currently i mean i played the witcher 3 was the last big one but i mm, my uh, achievement score on xbox is, is quite proud of that <laughs> <laughs> it's a sign of many many games played i've been playing a bit of cod Warzone. um i'm i'm debating whether with myself whether to get mass effect legendary edition and play through that again um because mass effect was awesome but I've been there. I've been to that world, that galaxy. So video games is the thing, but also away from the hobby, I'll read books. Um, uh, I, I, I read quite a lot. And uh, fictional work is all 40K at the moment, but I'll also read um, factual stuff and listen to podcasts and things like that. I'm interested in stuff and things um, like the life, the universe and everything, science and all sorts of stuff. And yeah. Where do we come from? Where do we go? Where did we come from, Cotton Eye Joe? I'm interested in all that sort of stuff. So, <laughs> yeah, that's is that a hobby? I guess so. If you if, yeah. if you spend if you spend time doing it in your spare time and you find it fun, I guess that's a description of a hobby, isn't it? Yeah, my my friends, I've got a friend who says that I'm his phone a friend on who wants to be a millionaire because I know a I know a little bit about a lot of things. And I mean a tiny bit, but about a lot of things. Because if I'm in, uh, Quipster said it as well on one of the podcasts that we do on DC. If I'm interested in something, I will go and get a couple of books and go down the wicked. I'm really annoying um, about someone. <laughs> if someone, I will really research something, I go to, yeah. So I'm, I've got a very compulsive personality. Okay. When I set up a YouTube channel, I keep going. When I'm going <laughs> in the factory and it's killing me, I keep going. When I, yeah, when I play video games, I kept going. I do things to, I can't help it. There's no beer or chocolate in this house because if there was, I'd eat it all and drink it all. So we have to, I so, can't stop myself. So you commit, when you go for something, you, you commit and you jump in feet first. I don't just, yeah, I don't just commit and jump in feet first, but I seem to, I always seem to find myself going further and deeper than everyone around me, almost everyone around me. For some reason, I don't know why it's, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's not necessarily, you know, you're painting it up like there's not really going to be too much of a bad element to it because it's led you to where you are now. So, oh, it, you know, it leads to lots of misadventures. And oh, I don't doubt life. that for a second. Mis misadventures <laughs> build character. And I think that's, that's, that's the positive spin I'll try and put on that. <laughs> there's always that idea that if you if yourself in the future doesn't come back and stop you doing it how bad an idea can it be well yeah yeah you can't you can't really argue that <laughs> no it's, yeah so no oh, hobbies outside um very tiny because like i said if i'm going to do something i do it hugely and uh like when warzone cod warzone happened i played that like pretty much every day for a month to thrash it, to stop, get it out of my system. And the reason why I'm playing a little bit of COD Warzone now with some of the boys, some of the regulars is, I, 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 
because they they love playing it and they're playing it all the time or playing it and I, I try not to play it so that's why it's like a couple of hours a week and then step away a couple of hours a week step away yeah otherwise i'll just i'll go down that rabbit hole it's like teasing with a mass effect legendary thing is i don't want to yeah it's weird you'll disappear down the rabbit hole <laughs> there's certain <laughs> video games out there you know like skyrim oh, oh yeah. yeah yeah oh yeah there's certain video games out there which i deliberately stayed away from because i've played so like oblivion that, that's i yeah i i'd lost a year in oblivion world of warcraft i can't touch that so Skyrim, I stayed away from the certain video games that I deliberately stay away from because I know what I'm like. I'll, I won't eat. <laughs> I'll just play. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm not that big into like the computer games. I've, you know, I've, I've got, I've got a PlayStation Four, so that'll tell you I'm not a proper hardcore gamer. Um, but obviously, Skyrim is one of those games where it drew me in, and I was playing it for days on end like you say almost yeah. forgetting to eat and you'd stand up after like three or four solid hours you'd be like wow i've needed a pee for quite some time and i've just ignored yeah. that like basic need um and skyrim was one of those games that even did that to me so you know and i don't have that sort of personality so <laughs> i'm sure if you got sucked in by skyrim that we'd never see you again and that would be a terrible it thing wouldn't. it would be a shame it would. <laughs> you wouldn't see me so okay cool well, on that note, fantastic. I was going to say, all I can do is thank you for coming and joining us for this little chat. It will appear live on YouTube. Hang on, let me check the release schedule. Um, I've not even written it up there. So I think it's the 25th of June. Um, right. As, as, a, as people are listening to it, it should be the 25th of June now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so all there's left for me to do is thank you for coming on and say goodbye to everybody. Goodbye to everybody. <laughs> Thank you.